Right. Scene one, sing about me, I'm dying of thirst. Open on a bunker in the basement of a house. It's dark, but there are emergency lights on the walls. We see boxes labeled with what supplies it holds, such as tissue, pantry items, in case of a flood, in case of a fire, in case of dehydration. Anything you think you'll ever need in case of the end of the world actually comes. It's inside of this bunker. Tanya is seated on a fold-out chair with her legs shaking. It's quiet. She's, she gets up and paces for a while before she can't take it and walks up the stairs. She opens the door and hears screaming and chaos. She immediately closes the door and runs back downstairs. She holds herself. A few minutes go by before she hears the door open and with it is a sound of terror and fear. We see a man bringing books and bags down the stairs. I thought that maybe, maybe you'll want to read, you know, uh, later. He sets the books on the floor by her chair and he sits in the one on the opposite side of her. He fiddles with his hands for a minute before he gets up and sets up the futon. I was going to go with the sofa couch, but this seemed like a better idea. I mean, it was easier to get down the steps. She says nothing, not even a peep. Well, it's here if you want to, um, yeah. The Jeffersons, did they leave? They decided to take their chances. The Watsons? They are um, packing now. Do you know where they're going? Not that it'll make a difference, but I hear Texas. They have family there. <laughs> they have family there. They won't make it out of the city in time and you're okay with that? Is that a question? It's a statement considering you didn't tell them until it was too late. I gave them more than enough time for them to pack and move. Yes, because one month is enough to tell someone that an asteroid is coming and that they need to be prepared to move. Especially seen as though you knew for years and said nothing. And what do you think I was doing down here? Playing camp? Don't act no so naive, Tanya. You're just as guilty. And how was I supposed to know when you didn't tell me until you told them? You didn't report it to your job. If they had done their jobs and listened as well, they would have seen it coming like I did. All they wanted to do was call me crazy. Well, look at them now. Besides, arguing about it now isn't going to help. You're right. It won't help, but we can. We should be out there helping people pack. She tries to move towards the door, but he grabs her. She tries to fight him off. Damn it, Tony, let them go. We need to help them. You can't help them. I know you want to, but, but they made their choice and when they decided to stay. She stops fighting him and slowly slides down to the floor. What are we supposed to do when they're, when they're gone? He squats next to her. Uh, we rebuild the city. He gets up and goes into the bag he brought down with the books and pulls out a folder. I know you think that I'm an asshole and I probably am, but I think we can make this into a place that we would want our children to live. He moves to her and takes her hand, helping her up. They move to the futon and he holds her. I have a plan. Just trust me, okay? She nods and he holds her. It's getting worse up there, isn't it? Um, a couple of people began beating on the door and I, I couldn't face them. She looks at him and they share a moment. She re realizes he's a stranger, but she understands what he did. Show me your plan. He opens the folder and begins to show her everything he's figured out. Scene two, institutionalized. Early afternoon and the sun strikes all and everything that dares to come outside. We see Andre inside the Tony Everbright Museum of Science and Technology. He walks around gazing at all the amazing spectacles, intrigued by the fame that one man received, yet slighted that he hasn't done the same. He stops in front of the bus of Anthony Everbright and presses the intercom button. Soon a narration begins. Hello, and welcome to the Tony Everbright Museum of Sciences and Technology, located 16 minutes outside of Emmerglen, the city that's always prepared. You are here to learn and celebrate the life and legacy of Anthony Clifford Everbright, who was more than a common man. He was a man with a plan who executed it to perfection. When the asteroid hit the city of Emerald, 
in the year of 1981, no one was prepared for the attack except for one man. Moving quickly, he stocked up on enough food and supplies for him and his wife to last them three years. And he also learned how to grow vegetation in the dark, which was nothing short of a miracle, of science that is. After the asteroid destroyed the majority of the city, he was able to rebuild with the help of surrounding cities and government funds. Because of Anthony Everbright, Emerlin was able to move forward into the future when other cities simply would have become government landmines. Thank you for your interest and enjoy the rest of the museum. Andre begins to read the engraving. Anthony Everbright was more than a scientist. He was a visionary and a leader with foresight that we all wished we had. A courageous man who went against the odds, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, lucky old man. The bus mean mugs Andre, then... Isn't that what science is? Excuse me? Andre looks around when he notices Jeffrey. I didn't mean to startle you. I'm Jeffrey Barkley. Jeffrey Barkley, the, um, uh... The astrophysicist. You're Andre Wright, brilliant scientist in a small town and no one understands your talent. You make me sound better than I am. How do you, um... It's my job. I know all the talented people in my field. You might try to come after my job, so I better know who you're, who I'm dealing with, right? You know, I wish I could say this was a chance encounter, but you're smarter than that, and I'll get right to it. I need you in Emerlin. That's the city this guy built from the ground up, huh? What's there for me that I don't have back home? Well, for starters, decent place for you and your wife to raise a child, a great job offer that can make your name a household one, and lastly, protection. Protection from? I'm sure you heard of the asteroid. Yeah, it's projected to hit maybe three years. What if I told you that maybe is a guarantee? I would say, how could you be so sure? Well, it's no secret that my city likes to stay prepared. We like to be on top of things. But listen, we've got a group that we're working with right now. We think you'll be perfect with. What exactly are they doing? Building prototypes and running drills. Drills? In preparation for the asteroid. Look, it's more complicated than I can explain right now, but I like to to consider it. He pulls out his business card and hands it to him. Andre takes it. I thought it took years to be able to get into Emerlin. So how could I even... Kid, you're, when you're as brilliant and capable of great things such as yourself, you'll make friends slowly and frenemies quickly. You'll let me worry about that. Just let me know if you're in or out and I'll put in your application this evening. What happened to think it over? You could do that, but we both know your answer because you want to be like that man right there. And I can guarantee that for you. All I need is a little yes or no. The museum fades and we arrive in the living room of the Wright family with Erica folding clothes. Absolutely not. I'm supposed to pack up my home from an asteroid that may or may not hit in a couple of years. That's ridiculous. Uh that's why that's what they said in 81 you saw what happened that was different he knew it was coming and did nothing we get these alerts all the time babe and truthfully they're designed to keep us on our toes it's not like we can do anything about it what if i could confirm that it was coming what do you mean you can confirm as in i know for a fact that it's going to hit you're fucking me with me right now aren't you Andre? What the? Look, it, how do you know this? It's a good thing that we know now and can do something about it. Andre, you do realize that even if we pack up, we still don't know if we'll even get in? We'll be guaranteed a spot with my job and like a one-off interview. Oh, come on. You've seen the people that live there. I mean, remember Mark and his family? They got accepted and haven't even left to come back to visit like they said they would. And they haven't even called. And why are they in such a rush to get you there anyway? I, no, I don't like it. I'll be doing important work. I don't like it. So what? We're just supposed to wait and die? Build a bunker. Build a bunker. 
Nice. And once everyone is killed, we can come up and break bread with our destroyed town. And what do they have in Emerald that's going to save us? Advanced technology. They're actively working on ways to combat this. Advanced technology. That, that's it? What does that even mean? I don't know. But I'd rather take my chances in a city that literally walks on gold than a city that can't even figure out its own garbage problem. Well, when you put it that way, what else can I say? I'm sorry. Just I'm going to bed. I'm tired. Erica, I've already accepted the job. I know that what I'm doing is right, and it'll safely secure our future and the future of those we love. We have an interview in a week. You're actually unbelievable. So the people here, what are they supposed to do? I'm doing this for the people here. We make a break there and we can bring it into other cities and protect them as well. What's so sad is that I'm sure you really believe that. Erica exits and Andre sits, hand on face, knees or back of the neck, anywhere to keep him from dealing with the moment. Um, well, it's up on the right family's living room. You can see the personality of the person who decorated throughout the room. Colorful flowers, antique vases, wacky posters with weird sayings all up. On the couch is Andre and Erica, and in the chair directly to the right of them is Misty, a representative from Emberlin. She has a tablet in her hand and the most creepy smiling face that everyone, anyone has seen. It's by no means hideous, just unsettling. She wears her hair in a back bun and wears a beautiful sweater with a button that says Emberlin, housing committee. She pulls up a form and reads it. Well, all right, let's get started, huh? Let's see. You are the right family? Yes, that's us. Great. When we received your application, we thought you were wonderful candidates. Really? Well, of course, a scientist and writer. You can never have enough of those in the world. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's just a shame you don't have a bundle of joy to share your life with yet. Well, we've actually been doing some talking about that. Uh, we think right now is a good time to start a family. That's why we're interested in moving. Well, really, it's just been talk. <laughs> we haven't really decided on anything yet. Oh, well, no judgment or anything, but you might want to get on that. I mean, you are in your mid-30s, and I don't have to tell you that your body is going to have some changes and make things difficult when it comes to conceiving a baby. I know that. What does that have to do with us moving? As you know, Emberlin is a family-based community and city. It helps that we know your stance on family and having one. It would make the other families more comfortable and that's what it's all about at the end of the day. I totally understand. So, how long have you lived in Ohio? Uh, well, Erica was born and raised here and I moved here two years before we married. And you're originally from Georgia? Guilty. <laughs> Not really a lot of programs that offer the study of uh, astrophysics there. Did you not like the University of Georgia? The Department of Physics and Astronomy is easily one of Georgia's best colleges, but to each his own. Right. Erica and Andre share a look. Your finances look amazing as well. Also, I'm so glad you filled out the questionnaire. It really helps us get a sense of who you are beyond the basics of knowing the jobs and the education levels. Alfredo lovers. It's the only dish Andre can make without burning anything. Really, it's the only dish she'll eat if I cook. <laughs> Delightful. I'm just going to say it. We really loved your application and your background check came back clean as well. If you're willing to accept, we are willing to offer you a home in Emeraldin. Just like that? And I thought this place was extremely exclusive and difficult to get into. I mean, we just put in our application last week and already we're accepted? I mean, there's probably a family that's waitlisted that probably needs this move more than us. I know it might come as a shock and it might hurt that your application made it past those others, but you wouldn't have gotten if you weren't supposed to. You deserve the invitation. So don't try to talk yourself out of it, you know? Well, I just... 
my wife and I are extremely happy to accept. Right, sweetie? Yeah, just thrilled. Sensational. Now, before you become a resident, I have to go over the bylaws and regulations with you, seeing as I'm head of HOA for our city. I'm also going to need to check for the home as well as your bank account information. Right, I have that for you. Bank account information? The currency of Emerald is a little different than what you're used to. We have to convert your money over to our system in order for you to buy anything. Okay. It may be shocking, but it's easier to deal with digital than paper. The check. Here you are. He reaches into his wallet and pulls it out and hands it to her. A lot of money. <laughs> but definitely worth it. Now, let's go over these rules and afterward we can sign the moving clause. Clause? You have your first six months to get a feel of how much you like Emerald, and then after the six month grace period is up, you have to decide how long you would like to stay. Of course, you can extend based on month to month or you can do year to year. It really depends on what you and your husband would like to do. Now, the rules. As Misty reads the rules to Andre and Erica, we see movers coming in with boxes and replacing all the colorful and wonderful items in the right household with all beige and plain colored items instead. They still look fancy and new, but not what they're accustomed to. Andre and Erica watch as everything changes around them, with Misty never taking her eyes off the tape, the tablet. 1.1 membership in the association is set forth in a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions for Emeraldin, and is limited to Emeraldin property owners and their eligible family members. Members in good standing shall be entitled to the use and enjoyment of amenities and the association. 1.2. Each member shall be prepared to present a form of identification before entering the workforce and any time requested by a staff member or director. Membership cards may be issued for children over the age of 12. In the case that a guest is found trying to enter the city under the guise of a resident, the penalty is death. A few outsiders walk through the living room with the last one looking at Erica. They smile and then a man mouths the word, free before turning and walking away. Eerie much? 1.3, the association assumes no responsibility for the personal property of any member. 1.4, the association assumes no responsibility for any accident or injury resulting from the use of association facilities. 1.5, a member is responsible for the conduct, dress and charges of his or herself and shall be monitored inside and outside their home. 1.6, a member is liable for any damage or loss caused to association property by the member. If a member is found trying to exit the city without well, permission, they are subject to penalty or jail time. 1.7, signs, posters, and notices shall not be posted on any association property without management authorization. Signs, posters, and notices shall not be nailed or affixed in any way to any trees, buildings, walls, fences, street poles, or existing signs or emailed or text. 1.8, pets, except as discussed in our sections of these rules and regulations, are permitted on the association common property only when leashed and under the control of their owners. Well, that just about covers everything. I sent an email of all of this and you both to go over yourself when you have the time. Please, Make yourself comfortable and don't be shy. Introduce yourself to your new neighbors. She gets up and walks to the door before she turns around. Welcome to Emeraldin, the city that's always prepared. She turns and leaves. What do you think? I think it's clean. Well, yeah, but <clears throat> uh, what about the people? They seem friendly because they all have those plastic smiles plastered on their faces. It doesn't give off friendly, it gives off joker vibes. We're here now, so let's make the best of it, okay? Besides, one of these days you'll meet Vanessa Barkley and then you'll have someone to bond with. He begins to go through the boxes in search of nothing in particular. Erica grabs the box with the blankets and begins to take them out. I don't really want to bond with anyone, especially when I like my old friends just fine. 
And did you notice those people when we were passing in? It didn't seem like the normal, <laughs> pleasant folk here. If you mean the homeless people, yes, I did. They won't bother us. They're on the outskirts of the city. They're probably the only real people here. Look, I know you're not happy here. I get that. But can you at least pretend for a week? And then maybe you won't have to pretend? I just feel guilty, you know? Yeah, I know. Are we bad people? Don't think like that. Let's eat, and then tomorrow we can meet our neighbors. It's been a long day. He exits. Erica sits. We're bad people. Her doorbell rings. She crosses the door. On the other side is her neighbor, Joyce, holding a bracelet and chicken alfredo. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Joyce. I live next door to you, and I noticed that you moved in today. I just wanted to say welcome. Oh, wow. How nice. It's chicken alfredo. Oh, I actually love that dish. I know. It's in your profile. I wanted to bring something I knew you'd eat. You have our questionnaire? Everyone does. It makes it easier to get to know people that way. Anywho, I didn't want to take up too much of your time, just wanted to welcome you. Thank you, it's a nice gesture. Don't worry about it. Also, I have this bracelet for you. It's not much, just something I made. I make them for the children in the neighborhood, but given the circumstance, I figured you'd like it instead. Oh, um, thanks. <laughs> Don't mention it. She turns to leave, but then... Give it a week and then you'll see how much you love it here. Besides, we need a writer for our newspaper. Maybe give that a try. She leaves. Why does everybody do that weird shit? Erica closes her door and places the Alfredo on the table and plays with the bracelet before putting it on and then quickly takes it off and places it on the table. Scene four, hood politics. Erica sits at her table with her laptop open and legs crossed. She wears a skirt and sweater, not to differ from that of the neighboring woman in her community. She also has on a bracelet that Joyce gave her. She taps her foot on the floor before her phone rings. Hello? Oh, Joyce, how nice of you to call. Yes, I have been quite busy. Well, did you read the latest? Oh, that's why you're calling. It was good, wasn't it? I I'm actually late for that now. Yeah, yeah, she seems nice. Yeah, you know, I, I would love to chat, but I have to go and get ready. I'm already behind. Andre enters. He's dressed for work. Joyce again? Yep. She wanted to congratulate me on my latest article. <clears throat> Said the part about the violas really touched her heart. Mm. You know, showing her uh, favoritism is really not going to make you a town favorite. You might start a war doing that. Well, darling, that's my plan. I'm an evil genius. Turn the townsfolk against each other, one nice cat lawn at a time. You joke, but I think it would do you some good to make some friends outside of Joyce. I swear she's nosy, but enough about her. Your, your, your husband is rubbing elbows with some pretty important people. Well, I'm glad your career is taking off. I just wish I had more to do. Well, think of it this way. This is only temporary until, you know, I actually prefer not to think of it that way. I, I missed my job at Mid-American. I mean, I felt needed there and I got to do real journalist work and pretty interviews. Well, you still have your interview with Vanessa. You two should hit it off. You're both very like-minded. Andre, the woman is rich and lounges in her mansion all day. We have nothing in common. You never know until you talk to her. Well, listen, I gotta go, but I love you. Write something about this town that's not gossip, and I promise you'll feel better. All right. Have a good day. She goes to kiss him, but he's already out the door. She looks at her watch and notices that she's late. She grabs her bag, places her laptop in it, and grabs her keys and leaves. She knocks on the door of the Barkley family. Vanessa, the housewife, answers. She's smarter than you know. Erica, please, come in. I'm so sorry I'm late. I had some trouble following the directions. No worries. Please, would you like something to drink? No, water is fine. Coming up. Please make yourself at home and set up or anything else you need to do. I won't be long. She exits to the kitchen while Erica looks around the home. It's waste 
way nicer than her own like way nicer the living room has a color theme of red white and black which fits with its modern decor she takes a seat on the perfectly red couch and places her bag on the matching coffee table in front of her vanessa returns here you are she hands her the water and notices the bracelet she examines it how cute did you make it yourself oh no a friend gave it to me how thoughtful she sits i'm surprised we haven't met yet with both our husbands working side by side well it's kind of hard to mingle with the rich when all of you stay in one spot that's literally gated off <laughs> hmm. so tell me about yourself well i'm originally from ohio and in high school i interned for this little magazine in my hometown is that it well no i'm Sorry, that question just caught me off guard. Don't you, don't go having a midlife crisis on me. If it's too much, then let's go back a little. How are you today at this moment? I'm fine, I'm good. Uh, the rehearsed response. We can move on if you like. That would be nice. So you've been here about three months now? How are you liking it? The people are nice. <laughs> what? It's just I asked you how you're enjoying the city and you tell me about the people. Is that your way of saying you hate it here? Is that obvious? No, not entirely. It seems you love the fashion here. That helps. Well, I'm just trying to fit in. But why would you fit in in a place that you hate? If anything, wouldn't you want to keep your originality? I never looked at it like that. I just sort of assumed it would be easier to make the time pass. You're not staying past the six months? Well, I hadn't talked about, to my husband about it, but maybe not. I'm, I'm not really sure. Hmm. Your husband seems to be enjoying it here. He's well-liked, taking meetings with the Nobel laureates. He's certainly making a name for himself. And here you are writing articles on botany. It's a little underwhelming, isn't it? Well, some would say that, but I have my personal essays and poems to help me. Oh, I would love to hear some if you have anything available. Oh, no, I don't want to. <laughs> Never sell yourself short. Please read something. OK. Um, I have this piece that I started a while back when I first got here about Emeron. Oh, this should be fun. Suburbia, the land of the middle class now reconstructed to include the poor, but only if they work hard, more than a nine to five or a six to 10. They pave the roads that send them out of their cul-de-sac and out into the workforce. The roads where every single streetlight works and watches, capturing all that occurs in the neighborhood. From the men storming into their cars and off to work to the children skipping to school. The motion of the cameras creates a dance of precision and intent catch anything that is out of order. The grass is always neatly cut and the sprinklers never touch the sidewalk or asphalt. The cars are des designated to the left of the garage and bikes to the right. This perfect display of life is not adapted. It is not learned, but demanded. Well, you really hate this place, huh? It's fine. It takes a bit of adjusting. I'll give you that. You're a pretty good writer. Thank you. Just a little fresh and naive. It's a shame, though, that you do all of these one-off pieces. Doesn't that bother you? Well, it can, but it's temporary. So I'll make do. Now on to you. Actually, not on to me. I want to talk more about you. How many friends have you made here? I have one good friend. Joyce, right? Yes, Joyce. <laughs> I'm not stalking you. Your, hus your husband mentioned her name. You know. Joyce and I moved here with our families from New York in 2022. After everything that happened the previous years, we just really wanted a fresh start. So we rolled the dice and moved here, a split second before it became exclusive. But when the change did come, Joyce and her husband had a hard time adjusting. I mean, it drove him insane. One night, he just disappeared. Never heard from again. I mean, we searched for him, but I guess he just didn't want to be found. Everyone had given up, but she swore someone knew something. 
That's why, that's when Joy started making those little bracelets. Let me guess. She showed up at your door with your favorite dish in that cute little thing, huh? Erica looks at the bracelet. Just a small word of advice. No one is nice for no reason. The sooner you learn that, the better. Besides, the obvious target on your back, you should be working upwards and not staggering in the same spot. In this place, if you aren't rich, you aren't anything. Joyce knows that, and she'll never be able to sit at the table I'm at. But there's still hope for you, and she'll cling to you. As soon as you slip up, she'll turn against you. Well, this was nice. Sorry that I have to go so suddenly, but I need to leave because I'm extremely uncomfortable. You enjoy the rest of your day. Erica, you think they treat you like an outcast now? Wait until you see how they treat you now that you've left my home. Oh, and don't worry. I emailed you something good that you can use in your article. Erica looks at the bracelet and exits the house. She returns to her home and takes it and submerges it in a cup of water. Immediately, she gets a phone call. Oh, Joyce, not right now. After the phone stops ringing, her doorbell rings. She moves to it and opens it to see Joyce. Hello, Joyce. You didn't answer my call, so I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Oh, I, I just got home. I didn't hear it ring. That's fine. So, how was your interview with Vanessa? Insightful. Well, what questions did you ask her? Just the basics. And what are the basics? You know, just about her and her husband and all that good stuff. Oh, okay. Look at you moving up in the world. Yeah, look at me. I am. What happened to your bracelet? Oh, I uh, got in the shower and I took it off and I can't seem to remember where I left it. Don't sweat it. I have another one right here. She pulls out another bracelet. No, you know what? Actually, Joyce, I'm just so tired and I just really want to go to bed. Well, here, just take this and I'll be on my way. No, I don't want your fucking peeping Tom bait bracelet. Just leave. So she got to you, huh? Yeah, Joyce. She told me everything I needed to know about this town and especially about you. How you all are just power hungry and greedy. And what do you think she is? How do you think she got her money? I don't know and I don't care. I thought I met one decent person in this hellhole and yet I was wrong. Did she tell you why everyone is scrambling and trying to move up? No, and I do not care. Well, you should, especially since it affects you too. I know you're not dumb. You know the asteroid is coming. So you move here thinking we have resources and that we'll all be prepared and, but it's all a bunch of bullshit. They only care about the rich. That's why everyone is trying their hardest to make it, riding the coattails of others. They're pathetic. It is what it is. But let me tell you this. When the shit comes down, don't say you were warned. She exits. <sighs> Fuck. Scene five, how much a dollar costs? Andre enters the house and sees Erica sitting. He already knows it's about to be some bullshit. Hey, honey. How'd the interview go? It was interesting. Yeah? In what way? Well, basically found out that you and I have a target on our back. Everyone wants to be rich because there's no security in this fucking shithole when you just scrape by and Joyce has been watching us through a fucking bracelet. All caught up? I'm getting there. Please tell me that you didn't know any of this. I've just been working, babe. On the bright side, we can move out of this hellhole since there's no protection here either. And go back home and take our chances, honey. She walks behind him and hugs him. Well, we can talk about a family if that's what we both want. Erica, we can't leave. She drops her arms and walks away from him. Why? Because your career is taking off? Your career can take off anywhere. We don't need these people. I signed on to do five years. I figured we could stay two years past the asteroid. But what the fuck is wrong with you? No, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're the only one. You're the only one fighting this place like it isn't fucking paradise. You don't have to work. We aren't paying any bills. You literally have it good. And I'm doing such great research that it's going to pay off for us. You just need to wait and see. 
Erica exits before he can even finish his sentence. She goes to the edge of the city and tries to leave, but every time she tries to go out, the system denies her. It frustrates her to the point of screaming. She stops, and when she looks up, she sees a man staring straight at her. She gets out of her car. How do you do it? Do what? Get out of the city. You either play the game or live long enough to control it, or you simply die. She stares at him. Die? I died. My wife mourned me. Even sent a search party, but I'm dead. Do you want to die? No. Then go live and stop wasting my precious time. Go. What the? Wait, Joyce? She's your... Yeah, she was. You seem like you have a profound insight on life. But how do I stop this? You be naive to think that you alone could do it. You alone could only cause trouble for everyone else. Well, it's a chance I'm willing to take. She gets back in her car. They love to talk. Let him. He disappears and she drives away, back to Vanessa's place. I thought you'd be back. You feed a stray cat, it always ends up coming back. Cut the shit, because I don't have time. Did you know? For someone who doesn't have much time, you sure ask dumb questions. Did you know that there's no protection for us? If it hits here, we're going to die. I knew, but you have nothing to worry about. Andre is on the right track. Can you stop talking in circles and just tell me straight, what is going on? Fine. They are afraid that that asteroid is coming and they think they can protect people with their new potential barrier, but not until they do an extensive research. That said, they're going to nuke this place in less than a month. <laughs> I, I must have, um, I had to have heard that wrong. What? You heard right. They're going to nuke this place. That's not even all of it. Not only will they nuke it to test how strong their barrier is, but only 10 families will be saved. Rich families, that is. Even those who don't, who won't know who they are until they get the call. Then they'll receive a code and they'll go into a secured location. Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. You keep saying that word like it's gonna help you. It's not. Well, well, what am I supposed to say when you tell me that in less than a fucking month, all these people are going to die except the 10 who are deemed worthy? Say that you're happy. It's not going to be you. And you're not gonna warn anyone, are you? Too afraid to lose your code? Honestly. Do you really think telling people is going to help, especially when they can't even leave the damn city without permission? It'll only cause hysteria. Besides, don't ever say your husband doesn't love you. He got you both a code and that's unheard of. Usually, you have to carry your own weight. Every time I think I figured out what the hell is going on, more shit gets revealed to me. And now I won't let it be just me. Erica. Be smart. Don't do something that's only going to heighten the situation. Mm. Erica raises her phone. No, I, I am smart. Smart enough to record you. Smart enough to send said recording to everyone in the city and smart enough to get the hell out of Dodge. Do you think it's a game to play with people's lives? This is life or death. And you sit here and tell me that the only the elite can determine who lives and dies? So fuck that. You don't even realize what you're doing. Yeah, I do. Something that you are incapable of doing, and that's telling them the truth. How they move is how they move. But I'm the one playing the game. Let's see how this turns out. Scene six, Mad City. Everything we see is in a shadow form. As we watch everything play out, we listen to Erica's essay. Suburbia. The land of the middle class now reconstructed to include the poor, but only if they work hard, more than, nine, more than a nine to five or a six to 10. They pave the roads that send them out of their cul-de-sac and out into the workforce. The roads where every single street light works and watches, capturing all that occurs in the neighborhood. From the men storming into their cars and off to work, to the children skipping to school. The motion of the cameras creates a dance of precision and intent to catch anything that is out of order. The grass is always neatly cut and the sprinklers never touch the sidewalk or asphalt. The cars are designated to the left of the garage and bikes to the right. 
This perfect display of life is not adapted, it is not learned, but demanded. If they can show that they are able to take orders correctly and are able to display it, it will be deemed special, special enough to move to the land of the rich where everything is paved in gold. Literally, there's no financial need for gold anymore since they deal in encrusted coins virtually, not physically. The land of the rich enclosed in an air of smugness so thick that it suffocates them. Every move, every inch, every hand calling to bring down the next. It makes for the great wasteland of perfection that is Emerlin. Once we see one image, it cuts to black as the next image comes across the screen. We watch as the middle class begins to rush the riches' houses. They begin to pull bodies out of doors. They destroy the homes of all the while. The elite watch above them as they wreak havoc on each other. We begin to hear screaming and yelling and crying. People beg for mercy, but it isn't granted. War and riot has overtaken the town. The streets are dirty as people lay bleeding and slowly dying. The cameras are busted and so are the streetlights. It's been two weeks. Houses are boarded off while some people take to the street to continue the fight. Lights rise on Vanessa and Jeffrey. They're sitting on the floor. Vanessa's shaking, house disheveled. Her phone rings and she quickly answers it. It's the elite. Hello? Vanessa, it's time. Yes? You and your husband played your part well. So it's today? Yes, the nuking will happen in three hours. You have until then to go out. Thank you, thank you so much. Once we rebuild the city, we will get it back to its roots and we're going to need you to do that. You did the heavy lifting, let us do the rest. I will, I will. The call, after the call, you'll receive directions on how to get out. Don't fool around. Once they press the button, everything goes down. I won't. They end the call. I won't. Lights down on Vanessa and Jeffrey and up on Andre and Erica as they sit in their living room. Is that what you wanted? You know, it's funny. We came here to help people and now we're the ones who need it. They promised they'd call. And you still don't get it. Get what, Erica? That you'd rather die in this hellhole than live and be a part of something bigger than yourself? I never wanted that, but it's obvious that you did. I wanted that for us. No, you wanted it for you. You wanted to be the next Tony Everbright instead of just being Andre White, right? That was your problem. And so what? You caused everything that's happened in the last few weeks. You did that. Not me. If, if this is how you want to spend this time arguing. Honestly, I can't remember the last time we did it. I love you, Erica. And if I didn't think that this was the best option for us, I wouldn't have brought us here. I love you, Andre but it's still sad that you truly believe that. Andre sits next to Erica and holds her when his phone begins to ring. He looks at it, but isn't sure if he wants to answer. They look at each other. He holds the phone. It continues to ring. Blackout. So scene one, Will Smith starts to blare through the space. We crawl through a, a bush and emerge into a forestry bedroom pod. Imagine a bedroom stuck right in the middle of a thick overgrown forest. There's a Fimby sprawled out in the bed. Their toes start to twitch. The twitch becomes a shake and the shake becomes a dance. The body of the Fimby begins to wake up to the sound of music. Soon Nova, they them, starts to get ready for the day. They try to resist the dance, but the body keeps moving and taking them around the room. They pick up an uh, outfit from the clean pile of clothes that they stash somewhere not clean. 
they eat waffle sandwiches as they put up their coziest put on their coziest outfit the feeling of it gives them the confidence to embrace the dance they finish their routine Noah throws on a pair of headphones they bop up on out of the pod they shimmy on down the road walking through the forest is like walking down the street just in thick green foliage Nova stops to smell the flowers. A loud and low snarl cuts through the air. Nova freezes. They slowly take out a headphone. The snarl roars again. A mountain lion crawls on stage. Nova slowly turns around and faces the mountain lion head on. They take a deep breath and stare down the mountain lion. The two engage in a very intense staring contest as the mountain lion creeps closer and closer. They're almost nose to nose when mountain lion blinks. You blinked. The mountain lion steps back. <laughs> That's okay, bud. You're following the baddest cat in these streets. <laughs> the mountain lion cuddles up to Nova. They scratch it. Someone calls from off the stage. Buddy! She's over here! Joe, she, her, rushes on with a treat for Buddy, the mountain lion. There you are. Hey, Nova. Hey. Come here, buddy. I got a treat for you. Buddy rushes back to Joe. Joe gives Buddy a treat and a nice rub. She nearly scared the shit out of me. Sorry. I just got Buddy this super cute new hat. And so I was getting ready for our walk, like always. And it was like, right as I was ready to walk out the door, I remembered the hat. So I was like, of course I'm going to put it on. So I turned around and I did kind of get sidetracked for a minute, but... It was only a minute, and when I came back, she was gone. But look, isn't it cute? Joe puts on a tiny pink cowboy hat on the mountain lion. A small gang of femmes dressed in pink run on stage. Joe, Nova, and Buddy huddle together confused. One of the femmes pulls out a camera and starts filming. Sade, she, her, the queen bee emerges. Does that thing belong to one of you? Yes. Is there a problem? Well, I must be looking at it. Whoa. Excuse me? Who gave you the right to put that wild animal on a leash? Um... Look at her. She's a beast. And you got her chained up like she's domestic. It's not good for you or the neighborhood. You're putting us all in danger and that animal by not letting it live the life it wants to live. Sade snaps her fingers. The camera flips on the group and Buddy... And once it decides it wants to be a wild animal again, it'll resent you and take you and us out because let's face it, it's a beast. This is a class A travesty and it's time we wrap this whole thing up. The femmes grab Buddy and run her off stage. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, Yo. Who the (laughs) fuck? Yo. You can't do this. What? But before they can really do anything, Buddy is gone with the gang of femmes. Sade and the and Cam, the camera femme, stay behind for one final moment. I hope this is a lesson to you both. Let wild things stay wild. Oh. And- oh. Uh-huh. Nova, without thinking, punches Sade in the face. She lays on the ground, knocked out cold. Shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Nova, what the fuck? What just happened? Bitch, don't play dumb now. I punched a person? And the people love it? Cam keeps rolling. Joe and Nova look at her. What are your names? Who are you? Cam the camera fam. And you? Who's that? Sade, she, her. Sugar pop queen of the stems. Also, Cam, she, her. And you? Uh, Sarah and Lee. Cam stops rolling and extends a hand. Nice to meet you. I'm sure we'll be seeing each other very soon. Cam picks up Sade and walks off. What the fuck was that? I think we just got robbed. What do we do? Go get her? Yeah, of course. Ah, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let that out. That that was a lot. I'll scream with you even. (laughs) Okay. One... Two, Two, three. three. Ah! Yeah, 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 that felt good. Do you need anything before we go? Nope. 
Let's do this. Joe and Nova march forward. Wait. Travel music. Nova and Joe share a set of ear pods. They march forward through the deep, dark forest. Scene two. The thick fog rolls through some trees and across the stage. The sound of a swampy beat pulses through the trees. Lights in all colors flash through the space. The lights spin and turn red and blue. A record scratches and sirens sound. The woods explode with screams of exclamations. The trees open up and reveal a bad bitch dance battle. Gangs of bad bitches cluster around as two bad bitches battle it out. Nova and Joe walk into this arena. They stand near the back and watch. A voice from overhead. All right, bad bitches. You know what time it is. This is the battle of the night. The last time Pinky took the stage was the last time the lights went out in Georgia. Inches has long hair, lashes, heels, and nails. Pinky is literally pink. They dance to kill. When Inches goes in for the sleigh, Pinky pulls out a pink sword. Everything stops. What is this, Pinky? You know what it you know what this is. You all set us up. What? We saw the live stream. We got your message. Mommy says, better luck next time. Pinky takes the sword and sticks it in the ground. The sagas are declaring war on the foxes. The DJ turns the tables. A slow pulse begins to pump through the air. A voice is heard above the lights. All right, y'all. You know what time it is. It's a bad bitch brawl. Half the crowd pulls out their signature pink weapons. The other half of the crowd, minus Nova and Joe, scrambles to gather their things. Nova and Joe duck and hide as everyone gets ready for a full bad bitch brawl. What do we do? How did we get here? Why are you always asking me the questions? What about you? What do you think we should do? I just want to find Buddy. Well, we got to get out of here first. This is about to be a war zone. Can't we just ask them to stop? Y'all bitches better be ready because it's about to go down. Five, four, three, two, one. Wait! Wait. The crowd halts and stares at Nova. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I see you're all about to get busy and we'll leave you all to it. Uh, but we're just kind of in a rush to find our pet buddy. She's a mountain lion, last seen wearing a tiny pink cowboy hat. She got snatched this morning, and we just want to find her and get out of your way. Air horn sound. New challenger alert. Whoa, whoa, what? No, no. This is not a challenge. We just want to find our buddy. Pinky starts to dance at Nova. Nova doesn't know what to do. What's happening? I think you have to dance. I can't dance. What? Yes, you can. Pinky goes for a sleigh, and Nova realizes they need to dip and dodge. Nearly missing a deadly dance move from Pinky, Nova stumbles back into Joe. Uh, nope. Joe! Help me! What do I do? A dance! You're an actual dancer! Pinky swings again at Joe and Nova. Joe jumps up and starts to dance with Pinky. Joe busts out some moves that Pinky was not ready for. Joe does a signature studly move that knocks Pinky out. Air horns blare from the DJ in the sky. Bim fatale. Oh shit. Now I knocked someone out too. You saved me though. And you look mighty fine doing it. Everyone whips around to see Sid. Sid, she, her, stands looking over everyone like the loving, firm, and rich zaddy that she is. Sorry, I hope it's okay if I compliment you. Yeah? I'm not gonna say thank you, though, because it's kind of just a fact. I never stop looking good. Good to know. Sugars, tell mommy I got the message, and if she really wants to talk about it, she can call me. The gangs clear the stage, leaving Joe, Nova, and Sid. Sarah and Lee, right? Well, depends on who's asking. Huh, I thought I was. Hi, I'm Sarah. This is Lee. Sarah, I love S names. Mine is Sid, she, her, but you can call me Zaddy. Uh, Thanks, Zaddy, but I think we're good here. You wouldn't happen to have seen a mountain lion, would you? 
actually, I have seen a mountain lion today. Really? Was she wearing a tiny pink cowboy hat? Sure was. Really cute hat. I know, right? Oh, great. Where is she? Follow me. I'll show you. Sid turns and walks away. Joe starts to follow. Nova stops her. Wait, why should we trust you? I didn't say you should, but Sarah looks like she really wants to find her pet. Is that cool with you? Come on, Nova. It's the best chance we've got right now. Okay, but I get to pick the travel music. Nah, I got it. Hey, DJ, play my Rainbow Cadillac playlist. The music plays through the space. Sid walks, Joe follows, Nova trails close behind. We enter a forestry sanctuary. Art is hanging all through the space, as well as interesting found objects. It's a bunch of stuff from that. Uh, ooh, it's a bunch of stuff Sid, Sid stole. Sid starts to give a tour and Nova is searching for Buddy. <laughs> so, you just called her a trapper? <laughs> yeah, a whole trapper. I thought I was the only person who used that word. Oh no, I picked it up in New York. Wow, wow. is that a? It sure is. Welcome to my little corner of the forest. I call it the sanctuary. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I know, I'm a collector. I take pride in the shit that I got. This is my favorite right here, limited edition. They only made three and I got it off a Ghanaian lady in Thailand. When did you go to Thailand? A few years before the- Is that Buddy? Locked in a glass cage, Buddy the mountain lion sits. She paws at the glass. Nova rushes over the glass, and as soon as they're ready to touch it, a trap is tripped. Nova is now tangled in a viney net. Nova! Hey, watch your step. There's a trap there. That's not funny, Sid. Let them go. I will, after you dance with me. What? You've got great moves, so dance with me, and I'll let them both go. I really don't do well with ultimatums. But don't trust her. It's probably a trap. Oh, come on. It's just a dance. One, one dance won't kill you. It might. DJ, play my Sanctuary Mix 3. Some music fills the space. Sid reaches out her hand to Joe. Joe doesn't want to move. Sid starts to tap her foot. She starts to two-step and then groove. Joe's body responds to Sid's as if it as if by hypnosis. Joe can't help but to move closer to Sid. Joe's body follows Sid's and Joe tries to resist, but Sid's moves are entrancing. Joe ends up in Sid's arms, and the moment they connect, they begin to move and sing. They dance together almost as one. Sid and Joe end their dance face to face. They drink each other in as they stop for a breath. Wow. Wow, indeed. Um, hello? Joe and Sid never break eye contact. Sid snaps her fingers. A gang of femmes enter and release Nova and Buddy. Okay, great. Well, it's been a time. Let's get out of here, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Sid. Bye, Joe. Nova and Joe exit. Scene four. Nova, Joe, and Buddy all caught up I'll cut her up back in Nova's home pod. What do you think is going to happen next? What do you mean? I, mean? I feel like this can't be over. I mean, we punched people. We saw a brawl unfold. I almost fell for another stud. Yeah. You know, wouldn't have seen that one coming, but... <laughs> I think we should go back. Go back? For what? Buddy and I were trapped. You fell in the trap by accident. Normal people don't have traps in their pods. Maybe not, but Sid takes pride in her collection. It makes sense. No, it doesn't. None of this makes sense. I know the forest is thick, but how have we never come across these gangs of fierce ass femmes? Maybe because we weren't looking for them. Or they don't want us looking for them. Stop it. What? You're about to conspiracy spiral. This doesn't have to be a conspiracy. I mean, but don't you want to know? 
I hit someone for you and buddy. And, and, and there was a sword and, and Ghani and Thai people. Who's mommy? See, there you go. We should go back. Really? Yeah. Something's up and we should figure it out. I mean, I don't want to say no, but I also think this is how people die in horror movies. But we're not in a horror movie. Aren't we? I mean, we're two femmes living in an overgrown forest because the government decided to lock us up in a little or a bubble five years longer than we were supposed to be here. I dead ass have a pet mountain lion for protection. And no offense, buddy, you're the absolute best and I would trade you for the world, but you're too soft to protect me. And I prefer it that way, but still. You're not wrong, but... But you can't let things go. Blah, blah, blah. I'm already down. But I think if we go, we need a plan or an excuse or something. What about a dance? You want to dance. No. I mean, usually, but no. I mean... Everyone was dancing. Even Sid was willing to trade our literal lives for a dance. Maybe we throw a dance, invite the whole forest, and then we can just start asking around. Again, about what? The gangs, Joe. I want to know more about the gangs. Best curiosity thing of yours. If you don't even know what you're looking for, you might end up finding something you don't like. You gotta be more intentional. No, look, best case scenario, we throw a dance party, we get to know the gangs, they get to know us, find out we're all super chill and we're all friends. Boom, never have to worry about protection again. Worst case scenario, we get to know the gangs, the gangs hate us and we're back in the brawl. But even that won't be that bad because you can slay for us. I can't take on those gangs all at once. But I can't dance, Joe. Yes, you can. I've seen you. You've seen me wiggle around. I'm not trained. I barely have a rhythm. Where's your music? Joe, I'm not doing this with you. If you want to throw a dance, you have to feel confident moving at your own party. So get up. If a training montage is what you want, a training montage is what you'll get. Really? Hey, DJ, play that funky music. Funky music plays over the space. A dance montage takes place. Nova and Joe train. They create a dance space. They send out invites. And then the space floods with bad bitches dancing. Scene five. Cam the camera fan finds Nova and Joe and sticks a camera in their faces. Nice party, y'all. Why are you doing it? Does there have to be a why? This is a bad bitch brawl and bad bitches do what they want. Fair enough. The stream wants to know if, you're, if you plan on battling again. They really love seeing you two step up to some of the baddest bitches in the forest. That wasn't our intention. It was truly all just a- A way to send a message to the people that anyone can be a bad bitch. And if you're feeling particularly bad tonight, then come on down. We're here, we're queer, and we're not going anywhere. If you want to find out more about the actual baddest bitches in the forest, then you'll have to come see us for yourselves. Love that. And so do the people. If they do, they'll show up. Cam wiggles away, leaving Joe and Nova. What was that? I've got a plan. But we already have a plan. Well, I'm improvising. Relax, just dance and mingle. Nova wiggles over to someone with blue hair. Sid slides up next to Joe. Hey there, stranger. Sid! Oh, uh, hey, it's good to see you. Yeah, you too. You left us back in my pod. Sid hands Joe a tiny pink cowboy hat. Thank you. Of course. So would you like to dance? Wow, did my moves hook you that quick? Something like that. Joe takes Sid to the center of the dance floor. They move together. Nova runs over to Cam. Hey, Cam, watch this. Nova pulls out a bullhorn. May I have your attention, please? Please, if I may have your attention. I am making a call to all the bad bitches in the forest. If you think that you're the baddest bitch, 
I think it's time we prove it. Now I've heard word that some of y'all really think you're hot shit. I'm here to tell you if it hasn't been proven yet, we need to settle this now. Once and for all, who is the baddest bitch of them all? The crowd erupts into cheers. Make space, make space. Joe rushes over to Nova. What are you doing? Freestyling. Come on, I gotta keep the vibe up. Go in the center. Everyone follows along as Nova leads the crowd. Freestyling. Come on, I gotta keep the vibe up. Go in the center. Mm -hmm. If you're a bad bitch, wave your hands in the air. If you're a bad bitch, shake your derriere. If you're a bad bitch, say, I don't care. I don't, I don't care. care. If you're a bad bitch, I want to see it with your hair. If you're a bad bitch, then show up your flair. If you're a bad bitch, then hype up your friend. Oh, friend. Oh, friend. Oh, friend. Oh, friend. Oh, friend. Oh, friend. If y'all some bad bitches, then where your friends at? If y'all some bad bitches, throw your thing in the air. If y'all some bad bitches, let me hear you go. The skirt keeps going and becomes its own beat. Bad bitches freestyle to the beat of themselves. A siren blares from overhead. The lights cut. Buzzing is heard. The lights spiral around before coming back up. Sade illuminates and commands attention. You, frat daddy. Um, me? Yeah, bitch, you. Ooh. I did some deep healing and thinking after your little stunt, and I've decided that it was only fair that I come to you directly to your party and beat your ass down in front of the whole forest. Oh, this is gonna be good. Joe moves towards Nova and Sid stops her. Hmm, I see. I clearly knocked your brain a little loose, so maybe I should knock it and you back into your place. Ooh. I DJ, play my slaylist. Sade pulls out some fuzzy nunchucks. All right, bitches, it's time to slay. Bad bitch battle, Sade versus Lee. What? In five, four, three, two, one. Nova takes a deep breath and remembers their training. Sade and Nova battle the baddest bitch battle you could ever see. There's gas, cheers, close calls, crazy moves, stillness, chaos and an ass whooping. Nova stands over Sade, dancing circles over her, as if charging up to deliver a final move. The crowd swells as they watch. Finish her! Nova stops. They look to Joe. Joe gives an unsure shrug. I don't wanna do this. What's the matter? Can't finish what you start? No. I'm a bad bitch and I do what I want and I don't want to do this. I don't feel right fighting you. I, I, I hit you by accident. How do you accidentally hit someone? I just got overwhelmed and it threw my arm out. See, you dumb bitch, that's not an accident. Hey, leave them alone. Sid holds Joe back again. Let me go. Let them handle this. I got my buddy back. If you want to keep looking cute, I suggest you stand up and walk away. Sade slowly stands. This isn't the end of this. It can be. If you want it to, bad bitches do what they want. Sade storms off. The crowd erupts with cheers. Joe breaks from Sid's grips and rushes to Nova. They hug. You did it. You freaking killed it out there. Joe hits Nova. Now don't ever do something that stupid again. You see all the damn weapons they got? This is why we have a plan. Well, it, it worked. For you, my heart was pounding out of my chest. Well, breathe that now because I'm good. I'm proud of you. Now can we get out of here before Sade feels like coming back? Yeah, and I think I need to soak in some Epsom salt. I haven't moved like that uh, ever. And I know my body is gonna feel it tomorrow. Is that buddy's hat? Oh yeah. They just gave it to me. I guess we forgot it. Well, where's Buddy? Someone screams in the distance. Not again. <gasps> Joe and Nova run off stage.
scene one, the road. Our eyes are covered and it's all dark. The motion of a truck mushed with cramped bodies rattles across the dirt road. The wheels rock and rumble off the rough ground. The sound of tumbling, begging something batter against the trailer. Bam, the truck screeches to a stop. Yo, what the hell do you think you're doing? Driving the truck. Driving the, you, you gotta be kidding me. Driving the, ha, huh, I told you. I said, careful, bub. These outroads are old. These outroads got cracks, pots, potholes. Geez, the hell are you driving for anyway? You said I could drive. Well, now I'm changing my mind. No. Threat one restarts the engine. Threat two cranks it back off. What the hell do you think you're doing? Where do you get off telling me to buck the fuck up and get up starting up my truck? Oh, here we frickity go. I just can't do right by you now, can I? You do right to listen to me to start. I want to call trade, I'll call trade. Switch seats now. Threat two yanks the engine back on and floors it. What? What? What do you? Stop. Wait. Ping. Screech. Puff. Stop. Da -da 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 -da. What? Was that the? The trailer. Passenger door opens. Slam. Driver door opens. A ginger close. Matching heavy boots approach the trailer door of the truck. Whoosh. The metal opens to expose live cargo. Dancers from the south. The limbs and joints are completely bound so they cannot speak. What is exposed of them can now feel the sunlight bleeding in from the open trailer door. The dancers attempt to move what they can, struggling to sense where or when they may be. Threat one chuckles at the dancers' futile squirms. They make a lot of noise back here for a bunch of somewhat who can speak, huh? Verbal, I mean. Hey, bub, hey, watch this. Learn this from old Wrangle Trainer. Threat one bangs against the metal. The vibrations alert the dancer's squirms. Do you know where you are? <laughs> they don't got a clue. Probably don't understand me. Threat one breaks into an ultra-exaggerated movement for huh and confused. Two is busting from one's mockeries. The two roll on from their play. Meanwhile, the dancer's struggles intensify. Anger, confusion, fight, stuttering, tears. The smuggler's jolly goes on until thud, a body, falls limp to the trailer floor. One and two pause. Threat one steps into the container and leans into the body. No movement. Two's laughter fully subsides and becomes stale. Threat one grabs the silent dancers by the feet. The dancer's head chuck the dancer's head clunks against the trailer's bottom. One drags him out onto the dirt before two. They look. Is it dead? Don't know. One nudges the dancer's lump with a moderate boot. No response. Hmm. Well, let's go. Threat one walks over and closes the trailer door. One starts for the truck cab. Yep. Dead or no. One of them like that is no use for the boss. Threat 2 looks at the laid out dancer one last time. Nothing. Threat 2 turns and leaves for the truck. Passenger side this time. Boss's exchange rate for this better be big after all this trouble. The engine turns over. Dust floods the dancer's body as the truck pulls off and away and be beyond. Body in an empty dust patch off the road. What will you do? Twitch, jolt, sway? The body rolls about the ground. He gets himself to sit. He contracts against the bindings as tightly as possible, and then swiftly eases his body all at once. Tie by tie, the bindings slip off. A free leg, two free arms, and elbows. He peels the coverings from off his face. Inhale. His eyes are wide. Dancer. His spine builds to standing. Sore and bruised so his voice is quiet. He moves slow, disoriented. The dust settles down as the fading sun sets. A final ray hits a sign. Welcome to center point, Equiline, Yusha. An arrow points in the town's direction. Dancer, unable to read the distant text, yields to its shapes and follows it anyway. Dancer drags away, intent, by the assumed sign. Scene 2. 
D's Drink Bar. The bar only serves sludge. Beer made from the contained dirty water. The only water there is these days. A small somber gathering is taking place. Tender, a slinky cavernous person with a habit for hats and black, stands behind the bar next to Darren, a filling man who constantly rackets fumes, fears, and orders. Tender clutches their mug of sludge. A moon bear, a dancer under Darren's care, with an expressive sense for bleak, expansive knowledge and fashion, serves rounds with a tray of sludge shots to to attendees. Darren pours a considerable amount a considerable mound of sludge into a chalice on the bar sat before an empty space. Some attendees are more attentive than others, some sullen from the event, others distracted by the hour's heat. A person is changing their clothes in the corner. Too much wintry wear. Tender watches closely. Everyone seems a stranger now. Darren pats Tender on the shoulder. They flinch. Uh, Moonbear, you done serving? Moonbear lightly smiles and nods. Darren chuckles lightly, but this brief joy quickly fades. Okay, if I start? Tender nods yes and rests their eyes upon the mountaineering chalice. Darren clicks his glass with his fingernails. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those of you who have joined us today for the dirge of the late great berry tea please enjoy the gift of refreshments in his honor for those of you who drifted in thinking you take advantage of free drinks please recall that i am not that generous a man to be so gifting Hm. i do not respect the motive but even still you gotta pass the day because today isn't about me and patrons debts it isn't about this old sturdy drink bar And it's definitely not about how much trade worth I may or may not be missing out on as I watch you take that third shot. No. Today is about Barry. Hear, hear. Hear, hears. (laughs) He was a dear friend of mine from when we were young. He was clever with brains to suit. This, This bar was like a second home to him, except he got the concept of enough, unlike some of you's. <laughs> Whether you knew him as a patron of D's or friends that he never introduced me to, we all have something to be thankful to him for. The very clothes on your backs. Others, it is the connections which many of you, which many of you work. Wives and wishes. Well, for me, it was wives, not like any of them stuck, but that's neither here nor... <laughs> I mean... He was just a man after all. Magic, not included. Even if though he made it seem like he was magic sometimes, and and even if he was magic, that never guarantees that a person, someone will stay in your life with you. Tender eyes, Darren. But I think out of all the treasures many of us have gotten from Barry, there is none more valuable to me than this one right here. Darren turns to Tender. T doesn't know where to look. Tender, you are the last living piece of my best friend remaining. Your old man would have been so proud that on the day he didn't come home, his kiddo stayed in here holding down the fort and would continue to do so as my apprentice. The town may have searched and searched and I searched, but Barry's dedicated child stayed right here to care for one of the other precious things that their father helped raise up. D's drink bar. Center point, Equiline, Yusa is grateful to both of you. But now, uh, now that it has been settled that he is indeed very dead, we can all rest a little easier knowing that Barry T can finally do the same. Ain't that winning too, y'all? Darren smiles and raises his glass high. The attendees do the same. Tender raises what would be his father's glass with their own. Good, good. (laughs) They all gulp down the sludge. Everyone sighs from the bulky drink. The attendees disperse. Tender forces down the last gulp of their sludge. They stare down their vacant father's filled cup. Darren spots them. You gonna drink that? Of course not. 
Sorry to put you on the spot like that, you know. I had to make something, get something out of all this public talking. Figure maybe some of your sympathies might bleed on to me. <laughs> Darren reaches for the chalice. Tender pulls it away. Come on, T. Your father would have wanted a traditional drinks send-off just like this. Give the man some final respects and let somebody drink the glass. Preferably you, but I'll stand in. My father's not dead, Darren. Oh, this again. Oh, you've been talking the mystic. I keep telling you that X gesture's loony. Fairy tales. If you keep running up in that shop without any sense, that mist is going to take advantage of you. You'll, you'll turn around with the pockets of stone and no shoes. I promise you that. Darren goes for the chalice again, but Tender swiftly sweeps it away and tosses it into the bin. Cling, got a ling ding. The room vacuums in. Darren tightens. He looks stiffly upon T, but Tender is set. Darren's voice pulls softer, stricter. I just want to keep you safe, Tender. I'm all you got now. It has been too long since he went missing. I know, I know it. Everyone here does too. Your father's gone, and the sooner you face that, the better you'll start to be. How am I supposed to think my dad's dead? Because he is, Tender. He must be. No! Darren, there's no reason to it. He wouldn't just leave me on purpose like this. He leaves notes, sends me bottle stops, he, he left a, uh, He always lets me know something. Far as I know, we ain't got no jesters knocking up with mail. No messages. You know that, you know what that means. Well, that isn't... Uh, I can't accept it. I just can't accept it until I'm sure, all right? Tender whips their polishing rag onto the counter and pushes out the door. Darren looks to Moon Bear across the room. Moon's gaze falls away. Darren sighs. Okay. Darren whistles loud. Everyone looks. Hey, hey, we're closed now. Shops up, closed to the public. Hesitant straggler exits. Darren charges from round the bar and begins shooing them off. We're closed now, cause we're closed! Come on! Ha! Ha! Ya! Yeah, out! He whips the last exeter out with the tail of his rag. Darren stares sullenly at the door. Moon Bear slowly emerges from the corner and approaches. Darren turns. Moon sighs. ASL to Darren. Are you okay? He nods. I guess... You okay? Moon Bear nods. Did you want to say anything else? Darren takes four fingers of his dominant hand and taps them repeatedly upon his chin. Talk. Moon's mouth opens, then shuts, soundless. Hands drift to Moon's throat. Moon signs back no. Darren sighs out loud. Talk. Okay. We'll work on it. Uh, help me with these glasses, would you? I want to see if I can catch up with tea after. Moonbear collects stray drink glasses like cats and lulls them into wash bins. Darren layers yarn shoulder pads to his suspenders, pulls off his apron, gets a shawl, dress. Darren wipes off his glasses from the bins. He comes upon the tossed BT chalice and pauses. Moon swirls a new glass across the bar top. Darren looks up. He can't smile. Thud. The two jump. The door? Uh, we're closed! He storms from the door, swings it open, and a body falls into his arms. It's Dancer. Darren scooters back with the semi-conscious form in his arms. Moon Bear hustles towards them but slows in approach. Moon's eyes catch sight with the fading bodies. The body weakly slimes his hand against each side of his neck. Left, right, the hand falls away. All the glasses crumble from Moon Bear's arms and bounce to the floor. Spellcasters. A glaze fills Moon's sight as a two-tone hum rings from voiceless locations. The drum wallops low where even Darren can hear it. Moon is aware from the transfixation, though largely an influence of its incarnation. Dancer's unconscious will not keep his subconscious from communicating truth to this being. 
he's been searching for. Darren looks back at Moon, who has now subconsciously dug to the sides of Moon's own neck, rounding it and popping with the entry of data. Darren's face churns. His eyes stick to the sight of the moon of Moon's neck. He looks to the strong body now weak, warm in his arms, the weathered youth of the body's face. Darren's sight halts at the turtleneck of Darren's sight halts at the turtleneck neck of the body. He thinks of necks, necks, neck, freeze. <laughs> A buzz rides through Darren and he snaps to high alert. Darren takes the body full up in arms. Darren hustles out the door with the lug. Break. Moon gasps, released from the spell. Moon bear crumbles down from the pull away of their leave, feeling somehow ripped apart all over again. Moon bear clutches to the ground shaking, he, but finds the strength to drag up the bar door. Reach, handle, pull, stuck. No, locked. Bolted shut from the outside. Moon Bear desperately shakes upon the door. The window is suddenly shut from the outside. Click, lock, no exit. Moon Bear heaves, looking upon the old surroundings with a different set of eyes. The street. Dirt clumps mixed with loose sand and gravel that kicks up with a shallow step. The sun's gone, but the early eve earth is roasting. Timely darkness brings more chill. The wind picks up and tickles cold. Tender unclips the billow of their short pants that is attached to their belt. The materials fall loose to their ankles, full pants now. Tender's vest with many pockets, treasures, and necessities to bear. They pull a compacted hat to put on. T pushes forward just as a great freeze is taking over. The sky has fully turned from its pink reds to blue whites and the sand looks closer to snow. These are the perma winds from north brought on by the moon, just as the heat runs up laps from deer south. What a way of time for center point. What a way of life on the line. Chimes ring off with a wind at the entry of shack, the harbor, the lab, a shared space, home of work of mythic, a retired jester turned spiritualist and an endangered scientist of many lost things. Tender enters for a mythic at the harbor, the room is disheveled, for one. Notes are everywhere. The lighting of candles keeps the room dim with the sense of mystery to warm it. More chimes hang about from the ceiling, handmade, tender, maneuvers around them. Candles flicker from a wind cutting by. As tea moves more into the room, they can feel the space grow emptier than usual. Unusual. Mythic? Are you home? Tender stops at an excessive pile of notes on a table. Actually, it's massive. A mountain, if you will. They inspect the pile and pick up one message from the top to study. All the same message. Unsent bottle stop letters. But, but no bottles are to be found for these notes. Tender turns from the pile with one of the messages in hand. They search for more clues. Unbeknownst to them, the pile of notes from where they once were begins to take movement. Emerging up slow and still from the paper volcano, a figure of stature and flexibility. The figure pulls taut a rope, prepping to spring up the unwitting tender. Tender turns around. The figure freezes in place. Look, look, tender blinks. Mythic, what are you doing? It's just Mythic. Mythic starts to steadily retreat back into the note pile. T strikes over to tug Mythic back out. Mythic makes great effort, wiggling downwards into the notes. Come on! Come on! Tender increases their pull. Stop being so- Mythic jumps out upon one of Tender's pulls, causing Tender to pull back flat, while Mythic lands gently upon Mythic's feet. Tender groans out. What did you do that for? Mythic casually stretches out after having been in such a cramped position. Mythic dusts off Mythic's jewelry. The jewelry is clothing technology of Mythic's own invention. Body jewelry, elaborate, beautiful, swooping, dressing over neck, hip, head, feet, and shoulder. 
each beading harnesses the thermal properties of gemstones. Rows of amber for warming, diamond for cooling, and multi-quartz for stability, and other gems for other things, all triggered by the body's natural need for equilibrium. Mythic walks over to the note mountain and begins to reset them. Tender muscles to stand. You're not going back in there. Shh. Shh. Are you kidding me? Shh. Shush. As in hush. As in trap. The trap. Mush. Beat butter rum pum. Doot doot. I just came for an update on the letter from my father, okay? Did you finish decoding it? Mm, I don't have time or the mind for that. Try again later, friend. Later? Mythic! Mythic sticks an adhesive note over Tender's mouth. Tender peels it off and places a hand on Mythic's hand, stopping Mythic's busy work repiling. Mythic swats Tender's hands and works on. Please. That letter he sent you before he disappeared is my only shot at finding out where he might be. Come on, Mythic, everyone thinks he's dead. I can't give up on him, too. Mythic has finished the pile. Mythic hops up to re-enter. Tender catches Mythic by the arm. I'm not doing this again. Release me. I need to cloak to test my incoming guest. I don't know what that means. There's no one coming here. Ring de ling. Entry chimes ring. Tender and Mythic freeze. You've ruined it. Now I have to improvise. Mythic steps down, arms with a rope, and steps in front of Tender. All enter. Bring all of you. Welcome to the Moonlight Harbor at nightfall. You're early. Come on in. I know you're here. But as who or what this time? I don't know. More times from the ceiling clang with a flash of movement. Mythic taunts the rope and proceeds to whip it into a lasso. I learned this one from my jester days. Mythic winks. Things just got country. A final chime rings. Mythic charges with the flying lasso. Clatter catch. The rope lands around the intruder. Tender scrambles over to help Mythic pull. Tender start, stands over amazed. Can't get the jump on a jumper. No, no. <laughs> the intruder wears a cascading hood. Much too long with heavy boots. Darkened goggles hide the visitor's eyes. Oh, Tender! <laughs> you are looking at something you've never seen before. I swear. Uh, Robert? I've, I've seen thieves plenty at the bar, Mythic. No, no, <laughs> you fool me. <laughs> Mythic leans in towards the catch. <laughs> Sorry for the rope, but you did bite me a time or two before. It is you, isn't it? Mythic stands. Backing some and exhales to take in the sight of the catch. Wow. Wow. Your size, your form. I gotta write this down. Mythic rushes for paper at the note pile. Why have I written on everything? Hey, hey, um, Mythic? Mm, yes, Biddy T? They're getting untied. Mythic turns rounds to look on with further fascination. Ah, yes, you do have thumbs this time. The visitor stands with an unignorable pulling presence. Residents gags and coughs up a clump of hair. Tender is disgusted. Mythic smacks the table laughing. Residence cuts in. <coughs> a, a slow transcendence from feline to human. <laughs> I think not. Rez chucks the hairball. Mythic leaps to Rez in a hug. It feels so good to be able to talk to you again, and with so much less pecking this time. Mythic, I've come for the map. Do you finally have it? Map. 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 Damn. <laughs> That's the only word you used to tweet. Thought you must have spent time with a pirate before me then. You know I started to try to learn how to speak cat because of you. Wow. Meow. <laughs> Did you get that? What dialect was it? Or or, or was it... Um... I'm finally enough to end up something you can understand, and <laughs> now you mock me. Have you retrieved your map, too? Or... Hello? Everybody looks at Tender. I was here first! Mythic, the letter, my dad, the code! Tender juts out an open palm. 
Mythic looks at it and cracks a smile. Mythic looks to Resident. Residence looks to Tender's hand. Ahem. <clears throat> Tender, don't be rude. Me? Rude? Really? Look, Mythic, I opened an exchange with you. I already brewed you the strongest sludge I could brew, so now you need to tell me what the decoded letter says now. Mythic's head cocks, teeth tick, and veins stiffen. Pity oh, tea, Teeter, look. You must have really lost yourself in the shuffle, eh? Because you seem to have really forgotten who it is you're speaking with. Perhaps with who is technically the proprietor of said letter, and who so graciously passed its existence on to you? Hmm? Mythic's form enhances a figure of extension beyond comprehension and power. Uh, apologies, Mythic. Resident steps in and gives Mythic a hearty scratch. Mythic yelps and recedes back. Your fear is showing. Cover it before it gets caught, Mythic. Resident pulls Tender aside as Mythic winces. The unreliable side that is also from Mystic Gesture Days. The fearing side that is from days you'll never know of. Soft angels tend to work best to dodge both. Mythic, this letter you have is all I have of him now. There was this funerary ceremony for my dad at the bar today. Darren poured him a stupid sending chalice and I'm just... Please, Mythic? Well, Mythic, will you hold up your deal or what? Mythic playfully bows before Residence. Residence kicks Mythic back to standing. Mythic laughs nervously. I unfortunately cannot. What? What do you mean cannot? Well, um, I'll show you. Mythic whisks to the flood of messages on a table and clears through them. From a small encasing box that was buried, Mythic pulls out the coated bottle stop letter from Barry T. Mythic brings it over and hands it off to Tender. I couldn't break the full message. I know too little. There's gibberish, signs, sounds, language I'm not familiar with. I failed. Take this for your troubles, okay? But I'll have to say our contract is void. Mythic plucks off a thick jewel on thread from the grand necklace and ties it to Tender's neck. Tender looks upon the scrambling letter, tears welling in their eyes. Mythic cannot look on the and begins to busy with a random project. Residence confronts Tender. Your name again? It's, um, Tender. T or something in a pinch. Named after my father. Very Tender, very T. I guess is officially off MIA and on the ED. Mm. Let me see that thing. Residence snags the letter from them. Careful with that. Oh, please, Tender. If there's anyone who can break that code, it'd be Residence. Res has seen and been just about everything. Hold on a moment. As Residence reads on, Res removes the worn goggles off in disbelief. Read. Reread. Residence lowers the letter with a growing anger overcoming. Residence confronts Mythic. Mm, yes? How can I help you, my dear friend? Now. The map. Right. Now. You've decoded it? That fast? What, what does it say? Where is he? Well, I don't keep the map here. It's too dangerous. Well, where can we find it? Wait, was that a we? Why do I need a map? Wait, what? what, 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 what <laughs> sorry, map? Residents and Mythic look to one another, then to T. Mythic entrances the room. The map you seek leads near and far to a place outside common speak. Take tongue, take cheek, take tongue, take cheek. This journey is not for the meek. It is of mystic, of horror, of advantage, and tale you may be thought untrue. The map is to Winifred Wanwin Manor. Find it before it finds you. Boom, an explosion bursts next door. The harbor shakes, mythic residence and tender brace. What was that? Bam, bam, bam. Hmm, nothing good. That was Dia's laboratory next door. Look, the wall, it's, 
It's cracking. Creak. Not long ago in shared time, the lab, Dia's space, Dia the doctor of many things people don't pay much attention to anymore, keeps a clean blank filled in space. An examination chair is the only thing where one might find mess. Fluids, blood, failed experiments, etc. There are some plants in a miniature greenhouse that wouldn't stand a chance outside the soil samples in jars, dust to rock to snow. She owns many chemistry vials filled with an ill-informed chemicals. Dia sits calmly at play with, play with them. Does she really know what she's doing or is there just no one else in town to act as a fact checker? The people may never know. Melt flesh without causing fatal damage and repair with cadaver without rejection? I wonder. Dia! Dia perks up. A tireless Darren burst in, cradling the body of Dancer. Dia jolts up. Whoa, bro. I don't need test dummies that urgently. Just get over here and help me. Darren dumps Dancer's body on the chair. Dia sighs. She, dri- she digs her stethoscope out from many, many scars she wears. Weak pulse, whispering heartbeat. Dia is c- discontent. <sighs> I think you're too late. You didn't even do anything. There's nothing to do. Slow pulse, circulating drain. Where'd I put that bedside manner book? Oh, this can't be happening. Darren splits a thick one at a corner. Dia immediately grabs a mop and cleans it. Is that grief? Tell me, are you sad? Were you close? Like, are you genuinely upset by law? What in the world are you saying to me right now? Oh, nothing. Um, just nonsense. Nonsense. Forget I asked. Besides, you know, we have bigger issues than whatever that thing on my table is. I mean, did you feel that heat this morning? That was... Darren yanks the mop from Dia's hands. Quiet about the damn temperature research. Check the body again. I already made my diagnosis. The kid's dying. Anyway, this has nothing to do with me. So if you could just let me get back to my <laughs> damn research. Nothing to do with you, huh? <laughs> that's That's funny. Check the body again, Dia. Dia's face turns confused. She looks over Dancer one more, this time with more attentiveness. Dia runs her hand over, checking Dancer's limbs and joints. She gets distracted by a stiff ligament or two on her way up to the neck. Hmm? Recognize something yet? I don't know, moderate onside early arthritis? Darren shoves Dia aside. He unfurls the turtleneck of Dancer's top. Darren sneers. Dia looks in close. Holy gamble, that's not the... It it, it can't be! (laughs) It is! Still think you got nothing to do with it? Dia flashes away to her chemicals. She retrieves a damp rag, returns to the body. Dia shoves Darren out of the way and proceeds to rub Dancer's neck with the rag. Darren goes over and yanks the rag out of her hands. Trust me, it's not pen marker. Birthmark, Dia. Bonafide, Dia. Dia shrinks. Could, could it maybe be a tattoo? Stop it! That birthmark looks like sunshine to me, doesn't it to you? Darren growls. Dia's sweating. She gulps. Um, unfortunately, yes. So then. With that, you are admitting to me that you, all that time ago, did not in fact kill Moonbear's twin brother, unless there's some other twin dancing sibling to Moonbear that has a kin birthmark to Moon's moon birthmark. Eh? Dia? No, I mean, I mean, yes, I'm, I mean, I I didn't kill the boy. Oh my god, I don't, I, I don't even know what to say to you right now. We had a direct order. This could ruin everything. Oh, when Juan finds out. Juan won't. Besides, the boy's second to death now, so it'll be settled soon, so... No, 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 no! It's solved itself! Look, he's dying! No, it's not solved itself, because Moonbear saw him already. What? What, did he just walk into the bar? How did he even find you? I don't know how. I would have loved to have also had some questions answered, but like you said, he's dying. Jeez! What's the point of you studying all this mess if you're no help at all? Darren sighs out long shaking his head and stomps over to Dia's chair. He sits low. Dia keeps a distance from her brother. She looks guilty to Darren. Neither are in eye line to Dancer on the table. This, this is all my fault. 
We don't have time for the obvious anymore. This mess and on the day of Barry's service. Well, we don't know if Barry's really... Barry's dead, okay? And even if it is anything else, I'm not... I'm never gonna see him again. So yeah, that's pretty much dead. Oh, I'm really sorry, B. I said don't call me that ever again. I'm... You're not... It's... I... <sighs> I'm I'm sorry, Darren. It's it, it slipped. It slipped. I'm so you sorry. You stop apologizing already. It's not like I'm not at fault. I knew that you didn't have the strength then, and you probably barely have it now. If I just listened to my gut back then and took care of the kid of myself, we wouldn't be in any of this. But no, I trust you one time, one time, and it gets me this. She could take the bar, you know that, right? Take your little lab rat lair too, you know that? All because of your brain-dead mistake. Thea's gaze falls in defeat. Behind them both with utmost self and vision, Dancer is sitting up at the table. He has risen unbeknownst. He weakly sides off the table as quietly as possible. Each bare foot lands on the floor. Darren stands suddenly. We gotta act in damage control. Yes, yes, right. Let's start with getting rid of the body. Darren turns. Dancer freezes. They both stare still. Dia turns to see. She gasps. Ahem. Excuse me there. Uh, but do you know where you are? Echo. Dancer's contracts inside. Darren cracks a sly smile. He turns to Dia. Can't remember the last time I got to say that one. Dia nervously forces a matching smile. Dancer flinches. Ah! 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 Don't you move a muscle. I know how dancers can be. All your expressions and your feelings and intellect inside and out. Like we get it already. I wonder if you even remember- Darren, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we should- yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. Okay, friend. <laughs> hey, why don't we just sit back down? And we're going to ask you a few questions. Dancer's face turns grimly angry. His fingers flex and taunt. They can see it. Casually from the chemical table behind him, Darren feels for one of, stray vi of the stray vials. Ah! Don't you do anything stupid. Dancer goes for it, but Darren chucks the vial. Darren, no! Everybody ducks. Boom. The vial explodes against the dividing wall. Gas spreads through the space. Darren and Dia cough. Dancer feels the wall, crushing himself upward. He feels the beginning crack that has formed. The smoke is beginning to clear some. Darren spots Dancer. Swiftly, with the remains of his strength, Dancer pounces his body into the cracked wall. Bam, bam, bam. Darren stomps towards him, but creak. The room rumbles. The room shakes more and more violently. The wall is splitting in pieces. Darren and Dia stumble about, grasping for stability in the largely unstable lab. Dancer hugs by the crumbling wall, shielding what he can of himself. Crash! Bang! Crumbling down goes the wall. The wreckage settles, and the sensation regains the division of the harbor and the lab are no more. Mythic peeks into the hole first. Hello? Everybody okay in there, neighbor? Followed by residents and a wary tender. Residence goes to step through the but dancer clings up upon res. Resident takes dancer up in arms, shocked. Dancer! Dancer faints. Is anyone hurt? Darren and Dia stand up and dust off. Tender spots Darren. Darren? Um, tender. <clears throat> um are you okay? I, di I didn't know you were- What are you- How did- I, I don't understand. Tender reckons the obliterated wall. Did you do this? They reckon Dancer's disheveled body. Did you do this? I can explain. Just just come in here a minute. And... Tender, I wouldn't if I were you. Another vial. Darren grabbed two. It readies behind his back. Dia spots in. Darren, what are you thinking? Come on, T. You can trust me. Just just come over here with us, okay? I just want to keep you safe. 
Tender looks to those beside them, mythic residents dancer. They look back to Darren. He stands very off now. Tender swallows, clutching the berry tea letter within their fists. The dismissive words of Darren ring clear through their ears again. I don't think I can go with you right now, Darren. Darren sucks his teeth. He sighs. <sighs> Dang, Tender. Now, I'm zero to nothing. Mythic can see it now. What? Everybody run! Darren tosses out the second vial. Dia ducks for it again. Residents clutching along a limp dancer, snags Tender, and runs for it. Mythic stands forth in the line of fire, protecting the escaping trio. Boom. Everything goes black. An echo of the boom, boom, boom turns into a heartbeat with the sounds of swift feet pattering a road. Heavy breaths come from one runner, Tender, still pushing to escape further. Meanwhile, the other residents emit steady exhales. Even while carrying an extra weight, Dancer, focusing on the tempo straddling life, we sink into the subconscious Dancer's inner mind. Within his brain lights a rhythm routine to the runner's breathy song. The sound of the heartbeat is gradually overtaken by a drum roll. Dancer sets to start. What follows is an expression of desperate healing, a fight of one's own life that is a simultaneous escape act for a dancer, an escape from death itself, the drums drawn to a slow timbre. Dancer moves against the beat. Hit, strike, hit, strike, hit, strike. His motions slow. Beat and movement, bang, slow motion, but he's pulling for himself to do it. The heartbeat begins to interrupt all over again, but it's not the runner's beats. It's his own faster and racing. The drums catch on. Dancer is swept up by the rhythm of his motions, flash, hastened by the reset pace. His brow strains to pull new phrases, new words to call. He twitches. The pain echoes back from the truth of his real body. Dancer wanes down, down, crushed by the beat. The brain's illuminance shallows around him until his fight is fully blown away. Real focus. Dancer's body is sprawled down and out in an alley of lost direction. A residence tends to Dancer with a bit of cloth, dabbing the sweat from his forehead and neck. Tender leans over heavy and breathless against a wall. Dancer's body rings as his breaths are quick and shallow. I can't believe it. I can't believe this. Darren, he just, did he try to kill me? You do know we weren't alone in that room, right? Holy gamble. Mythic! Mythic's dead? Mythic's fine. Trust me on that one. Come to think of it, I would have been fine too. And probably Dancer too. Hmm. So I guess it really would have been just you who could have died. Strange. I don't think I've ever been around someone so regular for so long. I'm sorry. This may be the slight shock still talking, but who were you again? Tender reckons the rattle breath body of dancer friend of yours and by friend of yours i mean friendly and by friendly i mean that person's not gonna snap up and try to murder me too right residence size this body his name is lost but we call him dancer he's a dancer from the south he is half of the divine lineage duet of humanity life movement and yes he's a friendly friend of mine I don't know why he's way out here though or how and what for, but I know that for him to have come and be in such a condition, it must be important. I'm sure even you could understand something like that, right? Making the highest bets for life against all odds. Dancer slows and slows and finally faints out again. Residence pauses, Tender stops. Res gets up and quickly approaches Tender. Let's trade. The drink you keep in your flask. What? Uh, what? 
Uh, how did you know I carried? The vague shape in your pocket. Flask. Residents juts out a ready hand. T retrieves their flask from their vest and gives it to rest. Observant of you. Residence uncaps the flask, lifts up Dancer's head, and proceeds to give him the drink. Protein, caffeine, vitamins, alcohol, lead. Very healthy. I called residence. I wouldn't claim it as my name. Residence or res. There. Res square. Res tosses tender the flask. Oh, um, sure. Drink for info. Like I'm back at the bar again, though I'm pretty sure I never want to go there ever again forever. T puts the flask away. Hey, you did fully decode my father's letter, right? Because I mean, it seems like you looked at it for like a second and suddenly there was some big deal about a map. Dancer stares some. You want to know what the letter said? That letter was fairly ordinary. It just seemed like more of a receipt, really. Or confirmation really because the way you reacted and that thing about the map the map is not your concern not my concern no what happened to we need the map remember look i know we don't know each other or anything but i'm assuming mythic is someone you trust well mythic is someone i trust too and mythic trusts me so then logically you should trust me too i think Res doesn't respond. Tender's upset begins to flare. I don't think you understand. That letter and the breaking of its message, that was the first sliver of information I've gotten on my dad in months. Everybody thinks he's dead. I saw that letter was received some time ago. This new revelation may seem hopeful to you, but I encourage you to look at the facts. Fact one. My dad addressed a bottle stop to Mythic. Two, it held a secret message. Three, you decoded it in a flash. Four, you won't tell me what it says. Did you forget we're hiding? Or was that just the shock shouting? Today, somebody said dead to my face. I was at his death service, center bar stool. And today, I finally got my last shred of possibility finally opened up. I mean, just a second ago, you were talking about against all odds with this one. So why has it got to be different for me? What's so different between my case and your by chance friend right here, huh? Residence inhales and exhales. It just read like a, a receipt. But then I thought if it was so normal, why encode it so deeply at all? And the scent directions were directly to Mythic. Why send it to Mythic to begin with? Why not directly to your own child? For something supposedly so normal, but with actions so odd, I could only assume it was a desperate attempt to get help. But like you said, it's been some time. And if he was so desperate back then, then. Uh, I never thought of that before. How could you? You didn't even know what it said. There was a name listed in the receipt structure. It looked like your father's transaction was carried out with Winifred Juan Winner. Juan? The silent broker? I didn't even know she was real. Juan is real. I know. And Mythic definitely knows. So how do you think Juan fits into this? Just an informed guess, but I think Juan kidnapped your father. This is just what I think. Oh, okay. Well, this is just a lot to take in. So this map you kept pushing about, where does that go? Does that, does that lead to Juan? Residence nods, tender takes a breath. Wait, so why exactly do you need to see Juan? Resident stops. We see a face of lights, muted voices, and animal cries pass across Res's mind. This is all within Residence's viewership alone. There is a great change as Res speaks. I don't know. Beg your pardon? I have been many forms and alive for many lives. 
but I've also haven't lived long. But I have always in every life been drawn. One, one, one. It sips in my mind. If it's all I have to go on, then I will go. Okay. All right. Were you ever by chance a jester at all? You're very poetic. No, I would have remembered that. Sure you would have. Suddenly Dancer grass. Springing upright and breathing well once again, Dancer is alive. Rest cups both hands on the sides of Dancer's neck and stares into his gaze. The information passing between them is beautiful, wretched, and historic. Tender is surprised by the interlude. Dancer settles, grasping, the, grasping to residence with a hug. He knows how his life was saved. He releases, scrambles to standing, and limps over to bomb rush Tender into a hug. T stumbles at the attack. Confused, Tender releases with a heartfelt smile, grazing his face. Resident stands. Tender huffs. Dancer playfully knocks Tender in the arm. If we can find this map to the Winifred Juan Winter Manor that Mythic has hidden, then you may just find your father alive. And I can finally find this Juan and reveal why she runs my head so much. I propose a continual agreement. We help one another get to Juan's manor, no matter what. With our skills combined and your providing of sludge. A continual agreement with two nearly complete strangers? Yeesh, I know my father would get on me for entering a deal like this, but should be fine if it's for his sake, right? Tender, residence, and dancer, three-way handshake. And since dancer has already chimed in to aid us in pack, we will assist him in his goal no matter what. In his hours, to the deaf, if need be. Why does this already feel like a bad idea? Swoosh, swoosh, in the distant incoming, T buckles. Rez preps to combat with Fizz. Dancer is still sore, but bucks up. Okay, learning y'all are the fight, third kind of fight, flea, freeze. Cool, 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 that's cool. Tender puts up a weak fist. Clinking, clinking sounds cry out of, out as the swishes impede them. Suddenly, the sounds stop. A presence can be felt in the gate before the entry of the trio's street alley hiding place. Everyone stays planted, eyes locked ahead. Roll a glass bottle with a string around it. Rolls from the shadows towards T, Rez, and Dancer. It stops at Tender's feet. They look and carefully pick it up. A bottle stop? Dancer and Residence look to Tender. T removes the message from inside the bottle. They read. Are you the friend of Mythics? Um, yes. Yes, we are! Dancer nudges Tender in the ribs. Ow. Well... Dancer, if it was a trap, it's too late now. Come on then and reveal yourself. Enter. She is dressed in royal blues and indigo paints, in a pair of pantaloons, a halfway cape with a beret upon her puffy head and the vehicle of wooden skis. Bottle stops clack on her belt. Map finders, I guess? They all slowly nod yes. Seventh Alley is a charm. Friends, follow quickly. Just as quickly as she appears, she slopes off. Yoink. The rolly strung bottle stops flies clanking away. The rolly strung bottle stop flies clanking away. The trio stutters to compute the quickly and quickly takes off the image of the strange friend and the sound of glass on crusty dirt stone and concrete patches. The space fades to empty as the grand quest has begun. In blackness, the sound hints of what is to come falls in. A clinking of metal man machine, a clinking of heels to marble, the falling of heavy coins, the moans and cries of the helpless. To be continued.